Hi everyone, my name is Derek Dreyer, and it's my pleasure to tell you about Ghost Cell, separating permissions from data in the Rust programming language. This is joint work with my students Josh Yanofsky, Hai Dong, and Ralph Jung at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in Germany. Let me get straight to the problem. The problem that we are tackling in this paper is that although Rust makes it easy to implement tree-like data structures, that is, data structures that are acyclic and where each node has at most one other node pointing to it, Rust makes it hard to implement graph-like data structures, that is, data structures that may contain cycles or where some nodes may have multiple pointers pointing to them. And in the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain to you why this is the case and what we can do about it. But let me start with a little background on Rust. Rust is a new programming language developed actively over the past decade whose high-level sales pitch is basically that it supports safe systems programming. On the one hand, like C and C++, Rust provides low-level control over memory allocation and data layout, which is critical for applications like web browsers or operating systems. But on the other hand, Rust is designed to avoid the pitfalls of C and C++ by guaranteeing type safety, memory safety, and data race freedom. The core idea that Rust uses to ensure safety is that the root of all evil in systems programming is sharing or aliasing of mutable state. And so Rust's type system enforces a discipline known as aliasing XOR mutability, or AXM, which says that there can either be multiple aliases or references to a value, or it can be mutable, but it can't be both at the same time. To enforce this discipline, Rust relies on the concept of ownership. By default, values are fully owned, which means that if you can refer to some value x of type t in your scope, then you know that there are no other aliases to it in the rest of the program, so you can read, write, or even deallocate x without worrying that you're creating dangling references or data races or things like that. However, if you want to create aliases to a value, for example, to pass it by reference, then that's called borrowing, and you have two ways of doing it. You can either create a shared reference or a mutable reference, depending on whether you want to allow multiple aliasing or mutation. If you want multiple aliasing, then you create a shared reference of type ampersand t, which you can copy freely, but you cannot use to mutate the value. If you want mutation, then you create a mutable reference of type ampersand mute t, which you cannot freely copy, it's a unique alias, but you can use it to mutate the value. So first let's start with the good news. Rust's AXM discipline works great for data structures with a clear tree-like structure, and the reason is simply that trees do not have any internal sharing. In other words, each child of a node owns a completely disjoint subtree from the other children, and so that greatly simplifies ownership reasoning. To make this more concrete, here's how you might define a tree type in Rust. The node type has a data field of type T, and left and right children, which are optional pointers to nodes. Now, the pointers to nodes are represented by this node ref type, which is just defined to be a box of, a, of a node T, box here being the Rust type of an owned pointer, a pointer that owns the thing it points to. And the key thing here is that because left and right are separate fields of this own pointer type, that means implicitly that they do not alias. In other words, they point to disjoint subtrees. That means that if we have a mutable reference to the root of the tree, we can safely use that to obtain a mutable reference to any node in the tree. This tree data structure also works great with shared references. If you have a shared reference to the root of the tree, uh, you can use that to obtain shared references to all the nodes in the tree. And you can duplicate those shared references freely so that multiple threads can read from the tree concurrently. Okay, so that's the good news. The bad news is that the AXM discipline does not work well for implementing data structures that do have internal sharing. In other words, where a node of the data structure may have multiple other nodes pointing to it, which is the case in general in graphs, as well as in doubly linked lists, like the one shown here. You see here that each of the nodes has two references to it, one from the previous and one from the next node. And so as a result, the only way to implement this in Rust, naively at least, would be to represent the links between nodes with shared references, since those are the kind that permit multiple references to the same node. The trouble is that if you were to naively make all the previous and next links in the doubly linked list into shared references, it would render the linked list type useless. Specifically, you can see here on the left, the tree type we showed before, and on the right, the new doubly linked list type. The only difference between these types is that we've changed the type of node links from the box type we had before to a shared reference type. But in doing so, the links between nodes have all become immutable. You cannot mutate through these references. And that's a disaster. If you can't mutate through these links, then you can't even construct a linked list in the first place, let alone mutate it. So this all begs the question, in Rust, is there any way to implement data structures with internal sharing at all? It turns out the answer is yes. There are two approaches that one can use. And both of them are effectively ways of working around the restrictions of the AXM discipline, but neither is really satisfactory. The first approach is to use unsafe code. Rust provides a variety of unsafe features as a kind of escape hatch for programmers to use when the AXM discipline gets too restrictive. For example, 
you can use raw pointers where the aliasing is not tracked by the type system. And this is, for example, what Rust's linked list library uses in its implementation of doubly linked lists. But once you use raw pointers, all bets are off. The language offers no safety guarantees for code that uses this feature. So obviously, we want to avoid having to use unsafe features like raw pointers, if at all possible. The second approach is to instead use one of the various so-called cell types that Rust provides. Cell types allow you to wrap a value of type T in such a way that you can safely mutate the value even if you only have a shared reference to the cell, a kind of functionality that in the Rust world is called interior mutability. Now on the one hand, interior mutability sounds like exactly what we want in the case of a graph or a doubly linked list. The nodes in the list are shared, but yet we still want to be able to mutate them. On the other hand, of course, there's no free lunch. Obviously, mutating shared state is not safe in general. And so in order to be safe, these cell types come with a variety of trade-offs. Some have pretty restricted APIs, some are not thread safe, some incur dynamic checks upon each access. In particular, if you want to be thread safe and allow concurrent reads of the underlying value of type T, basically your only option is RW lock of T, which synchronizes access to the value of type T with a reader writer lock. So using RW lock, we can take our doubly linked list type definition that we saw before. Remember, here we were naively defining node ref using a shared reference type uh, reference to a node, which meant we couldn't mutate it at all. And we can instead replace that with a shared reference to an RW lock of a node. With the RW lock wrapper in place, we can then safely mutate through a node reference. But unfortunately, doing this comes at a huge cost. Specifically, we are attaching a separate reader writer lock to each node of the list. Now that could be appropriate if you want to allow multiple threads to mutate the list at the same time, but if you just want to allow the list to be accessed according to the AXM discipline, in other words, either allow a single thread to mutate the list or multiple threads to read the list concurrently, then per node locking is massive overkill, very expensive. So to sum up, yes, you can, you can implement data structures with internal sharing in Rust today, but you either have to give up on safety or give up on performance. Is that a fundamental trade-off or can we do better? And the answer is, of course, yes, we can do better. In this paper, we propose a new solution to the problem of implementing data structures with internal sharing in Rust, which we call ghost cell. Ghost cell is a new cell type, which like the existing cell types, provides support for interior mutability for mutating safely through a shared reference. But unlike the existing cell types, ghost cell overcomes the trade-off between safety and performance. First of all, it's efficient. Ghost cell is a zero cost abstraction, meaning that it does not incur any dynamic cost in terms of time or space. Second of all, it's safe. We've done a formal proof that Ghost Cell is a safe extension to the Rust language, and we've mechanized that proof within the Rust Belt framework, which is implemented in Coq. And last but not least, it's flexible, meaning that unlike some existing cell types, Ghost Cell is thread safe and does not place any restrictions on the type of data being shared. The design of Ghost Cell is rooted in the observation that Rust's existing approaches to interior mutability incur unnecessary overhead for data structures with internal sharing because they tie permissions to data. That is, they enforce the AXM discipline at the granularity of individual aliased values, which is too fine. We already saw that, that it forced us into wrapping each node in the doubly linked list with an RW lock. The key idea of ghost cell is to instead allow you to separate permissions from data. Ghost cell lets you associate a single permission with a whole collection of data, like the collection of nodes in a linked list. Whoever has read or write permission to the whole collection can then read or write any node in the collection without any additional synchronization or dynamic checks. Concretely, GoCell realizes this idea using an old trick from the functional programming community called branded types. You may be familiar with branded types from the ST monad in Haskell. We call them branded types because they're types parameterized by a brand, which is a kind of static representative of a dynamic data structure. Specifically, we introduce two new types, ghost cell and ghost token. Ghost cell IDT describes a cell type for wrapping data of type T that belongs to some larger data structure, such as a doubly linked list, with brand ID. And ghost token ID describes the permission to access the contents of any ghost cells that are branded with that same brand ID. To get a feel for how this works, let's look at how to use ghost cell to implement doubly linked lists. Here you see the type definition we showed before with RW lock. And the first thing we're going to do is replace RW lock with ghost cell, since that's our new cell type. We then also have to parameterize the node data type over the brand ID, which will represent the entire doubly linked list that the node belongs to. And we just thread that parameter throughout the type definition. Lastly, note that ghost cell is really a zero cost abstraction. So the runtime representation of this node ref type is the same as if we had defined it using a naked shared reference. 
Okay, so now that we've defined our node type using ghost cell, let's see first how we can use it to construct a doubly linked list within a single thread T1. The first step is to create a new ghost token with a fresh brand ID. This gives us unique mutable ownership of the ghost token that we're going to use to control access to the linked list. So now let's start adding nodes to the list. We can first create a new node storing the data, say 41. And then if we want to put this node under the control of the ghost token, we can use the from mute method from the ghost cell API to wrap this node with a ghost cell with brand ID, the same brand as the ghost token. And that means we'll be able to mutate this node given only a shared reference to the ghost cell, so long as we control the ghost token. We can do the same thing with the rest of the nodes in the list. We can allocate them and then wrap them with ghost cells at the brand ID. And now comes the interesting part. We want to link these nodes together, which involves mutating their next and previous fields. To do this, we're going to use the borrow mute method from the ghost cell API to trade in our unique reference to the ghost token in exchange for a unique mutable reference to any one of the nodes in the list. In this case, we choose the first node. And that allows us to then update its next field to point to the second node. We can then regain ownership of the ghost token by giving up control over that first node. And we can then do the same thing for each of the other nodes, trading ownership of the ghost token for temporary ownership of each of the nodes in order to link them all together to form the doubly linked list. Finally, we can also use our ghost token to enable concurrent reads of the list from multiple threads. The key point here is that just as you can use a mutable reference to the ghost token to obtain a mutable reference to any node in the data structure, you can also use a shared reference to the ghost token to obtain a shared reference to any node in the data structure. In particular, we can first take our mutable reference to the ghost token and reborrow it as a shared reference, which we then freely copy and share between threads T1 and T2. And these threads can then use the borrow method from the ghost cell API together with these shared references to the ghost token to obtain shared references to all the nodes in the list. And using those shared references, the two threads can then perform unsynchronized reads of all the nodes in the list concurrently. Okay, so now you've seen how you can use a single ghost token to control access to all the nodes in a list. But that begs the question, how do you control access to the ghost token itself? And the answer is, you can do it however you want. Rust provides a variety of mechanisms for controlling ownership of objects. For example, you can use fork join parallelism to temporarily share ownership of the ghost token between multiple threads before getting back unique ownership at the end. You can use channels and message passing to transfer unique ownership of the ghost token directly from one thread to another. You can use locks, like the reader-writer lock we saw earlier in the talk, to synchronize access to the ghost token between multiple threads. But notice here that we're just using a single lock to protect the entire linked list, not one per node. The key takeaways here are that by separating the permission, in other words the ghost token, from the data, in other words the ghost cells that it's controlling, we allow you to use a single permission to control a whole data structure, even one with internal sharing, and you can manage ownership of that single permission however you want, using the existing means of ownership control that Rust provides. If you found this talk interesting, there's a lot more in the paper. First, we give details of the Ghost Cell API and examples of how to program with it. In order to encode branded types, the API relies crucially on the old trick of using rank 2 polymorphism to generate fresh brands. This is inspired by Haskell's RunST mechanism, except that in Rust, we have to represent brands using lifetimes rather than types, because Rust only supports rank 2 polymorphism over lifetime parameters, not type parameters. We also give an empirical evaluation to show that Ghost Cell outperforms other linked lists and graph implementations on several micro benchmarks, and we give a detailed description of our soundness proof for Ghost Cell. This is done as an extension to the Rust Belt soundness proof for Rust, and it was a non-trivial extension in that it required us to change how Rust Belt models lifetime inclusion. Thank you all for listening, and I'm looking forward to your questions.